Mark chapter 5, verse 22 begins reading just like this. Most of you know the story. And the Bible said, And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. What a statement from a man who is a religious man, but he says, if you'll do it, I know she'll be alive. She'll be all right. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And then we're going to skip over. Now, I want you to understand that they're on their way to this place where Jairus lives, where this dying daughter is. They're headed there, Brother Coon. But then we're going to skip over because right in the midst of all this, this woman with an issue of blood for 12 years comes behind in the press while they're on the way to his house, touches the hem of his garment. Most of you know the story of how that she was healed. But we're going to skip past that for sake of reading, and we're going to pick up in verse number 35. So those of you can jump down quickly. Mark chapter 5, verse 35. And it said, While he yet spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain which said, Thy daughter is dead, Why troublest thou the master any further? Then he said in verse 36, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. And then he said he suffered no man to follow him, save Peter and James, John the brother of James. And he cometh to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and seeth the tumult, and them that wept and wailed greatly, And when he was come in, he saith unto them, Why make you this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. And they laughed him to scorn, but when he had put them all out, he taketh the father and the mother of the damsel and them that were with him and entered in where the damsel was lying. And he took the damsel by the hand and said unto her, Talitha Kumai, which is being interpreted, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise, and straightway the damsel arose and walked, for she was of the age of twelve years, and they were astonished with a great astonishment. Amen. Now we've prayed over this service tonight. We're going to pray one more time over the Word of God. We're going to ask the Lord to just enlighten our mind and hearts with the Word of God. Trust Him to make a, a way in everything that we do. We've prayed over prayer requests tonight. But we're going to ask the Lord to bless the word that it's easy to be received, that it's palatable, that we'll, we'll be able to acknowledge it and we'll be able to digest it tonight. Sister Sharon, do you mind praying over the word tonight, if you will, please? Amen. Praise the Lord. You know, when I began to read uh, the Bible here and I began to read this text and what have you, I reflected back on whenever we were evangelizing. And uh, it was kind of unique to me because back whenever I was evangelizing, back way back in the day, if you will, I remember when, when I used to preach from this text, and my wife may remember this as well, but my daughter, you know, she was, you know, coming along, and I don't know, she might have been 10, 11 years old. Uh, but when I preached that message, I remember a couple of services where we had some powerful revivals, and I preached from this text, and, and uh, I had her lay across the uh, altar there, and uh, had, you know, as if Jesus had come in and laid his hands on the daughter, and she got up, and boy, we had church, you know. Uh, This is a story that, for all intents and purposes, is a very familiar territory for the church. Raise your hand if you've never heard this story before about this, about this little girl. Anybody that's never heard the story about this little girl? Well, all of us have heard it, uh, but when you begin to see the role that God plays in these stories, such as this right here. You'll understand better why that we're running in this vein of these life lessons every Thursday night. Because what we do on these Thursday night services, we're taking and we're extracting from the Word of God life lessons that are valuable to you and me that we find right out of the text. And it's unique because God designed the Word that way. That's why it's so easy to teach it. If you teach... And you understand teaching, you understand why it's so much easier, because the Word teaches itself. The the Word of God preaches itself. In reality, you look at God's Word, He designed it so that 
we learn something that we can apply to our lives every day. When I read about Samson and Delilah, there are lessons in that story. When I read about uh, Ananias and Sapphira, I read about Paul on his road to Damascus and how that God converted him. Or I read about the thieves on the cross, you know, uh, the men on the cross beside Jesus. Every story in the Bible that I just about you read, you can find some sort of life lesson that you apply to your life. Now, when I first got saved and I got in church, there were a lot of things I had to learn. I didn't understand a lot. Anybody ever been there? Most all of us that were there at some time, even if you were raised in church, it was a time you didn't understand much. And uh, I liked it when the preacher or the teacher kept it simple enough. And the easiest way to keep the Word of God simple and applicable is to allow it to be applied to everyday life. That's what we're going to do tonight. And I'm going to teach for a while, with the Lord's help, on life lessons from a dying daughter. That's what we're going to talk about tonight, and we're going to explore that just for a little while. Before we get too far, though, I want us to just kind of give a recap. And I know everybody knows this story, but I want to give it to you as if maybe you've never heard it before so that we don't miss anything. And plus, on top of that, it's easier to grasp the life lessons if you understand the story itself. Somebody tonight want to hear it, so teach, talk to me tonight. Amen. So what we're going to look at tonight is we're going to look at the fact that in the beginning of our text, Jesus is approached by a synagogue ruler whose name is Jairus. I want you to think about this. Because he is a synagogue ruler, that means that this man is a religious leader of sorts. What this means is that this man has got position. He's got notoriety. There are people, no doubt, that are under his administrative power that he can say go and they go and he says do and they do. But because this man is a religious leader of sorts, you have to understand that with his authority and with his position, that this man most likely could have been like many other Jews during that day of religious time. What was that, Brother Myers? Well, many of those Jews during that period of time did not accept Jesus as the Messiah. Many of them didn't. They were waiting on this long-awaited Messiah, and when Jesus showed up, many of the Jews rejected him, didn't believe in him, didn't receive that he was the Son of God. But this man, whether he was of that mind at some point in his life, I don't know. But now he's got a dying daughter back at home, and now he's made up his mind that I know who can heal this little girl. As a matter of fact, you read where that this Jairus, this ruler of the synagogue, went as far as to say that I believe that if you will pray for her, that she will live. Now, I want you to know that's saying a whole lot. Because during this time frame, that just like today in certain countries where you can grab a rabbit's foot or cut off a chicken leg and spread blood or do some voodoo or some kind of thing, there were people during that time frame that had some strange beliefs, wives' tales and things that they believed in, certain charms or certain things you could do. But instead of this man, we don't read of him going to anybody else, but he decides he's going to the very, the very one that is able to heal a dying daughter. You have to understand that when someone is dying, that, that institutes an emergency. If Sister Coon was to call me tonight at 11.30 and say, I need you to get to the hospital. Danny's on his way there. He's had a heart attack. Uh, he's dying. If you were to tell me that, you know what that would tell me? It is an emergency. It's bad. It's gotten real bad. It's more than he's got a head cold or he's not feeling too well. It is an emergency. And this man comes to Jesus, this ruler of the synagogue, a man with prestige and position and administrative power has gone to Jesus and begins to worship at his feet, giving him the status and deity, recognizing him, if you will, as being Lord and Savior. But Jairus begins to plead with Jesus to come and heal his daughter. His request is not for himself. He could have said, if you will, help me to be higher on the totem pole of success. He could have probably asked for a lot of things and been carnal. But this man comes to Jesus pleading his case. And his case is, Lord, I've got a dying daughter back at the house. And she needs somebody to heal her. She needs you to touch her. 
And so Jesus understands this, and we recognize that as soon as he hears this, they set out, it appears, on foot, and they're traveling in the direction to get to where this dying daughter is. I want you to understand that during the process of this, you, you heard me say earlier that there is an interruption in the process. All of a sudden, on their way to get to where this dying daughter is, here comes this woman who's been battling for 12 years with a disease that she's bleeding in her body. She's not even supposed to be out of the house, to be honest with you. And Jesus has already healed demons and or cast out demons. And, and he's already saw, shown in the Word of God where he'll raise the dead. And now he's in a position where that there's a woman who's got a disease in her body by all accounts under the ceremonial law. She would have caused him to be considered defiled because she touched him. Somebody that was unclean touched somebody that was clean, and by ceremonial law, that would have caused him to be unclean. But you cannot make Jesus unclean because you're unclean. That's the difference tonight. But this woman touches the hem of his garment. And right here while we're watching this emergency play out, while our daughter is dying back at the house, all of a sudden she has caused an interruption in the whole thing. The whole process is put on pause. I don't know about you, but I, I began to think about my own self and how I would feel if I was to go to Jesus and say, look, my wife is at the house and she's dying. I need you to come right now. It's an emergency. She's dying. And there you are on the way and there's a crowd everywhere and right from behind somebody reaches up, touches the hem of his garment and delays the whole healing that your wife or your daughter needs. Somebody say that would be an awkward moment. But either way, we understand that this is an interruption in the process while all of this has taken place. But after this woman touches Jesus, we read on in the Bible how that, that uh, uh, someone, a servant possibly from the household of Jairus comes running up possibly to where all this is happening and they, they spell it all out to Jairus and say, man, I don't know what should bother the master, that there's no need to bother him anymore because the little girl has now died. That little girl who was dying is now not dying. She is now dead. Somebody say dead tonight. And so the reality is, is that Jairus has now got terrible news. How many of you would hate to get news like that after you were really hoping for a breakthrough? I can only imagine how Mary and Martha felt when their brother Lazarus was laying there and maybe he was sick and dying and Jesus had not come yet. And after he was dead is when we find out that Jesus actually showed up. But when we read the Word of God here, we, we understand that Jesus overhears what is said. He overhears the news of that one that came to say, don't trouble him anymore. And Jesus looks at Jairus, I'm assuming. And when he, he spells it out to Jairus and says, be not afraid, but only believe. These are the words of Jesus. I find it amazing how that when we read what Jesus says, he is a man of few words, but when he says something, it has power and it has value. He doesn't have to write a book to be able to say uh, uh, something powerful. He says it in only a few words. I want you to put yourself in J. Iris' shoes. There you stand. You've got the news that your daughter has died. You don't know what to think, but Jesus heads it up by saying, don't, don't worry about it. Don't don't be afraid, but just believe. That's the message that he got. But I want you to understand that it is noteworthy, and I almost missed this myself, but I read over it again, and I almost missed it myself, but when I read the text one more time, I realized that Jesus separated the crowd. And Jesus, look, now listen, they, there was a thronging crowd all around Jesus the whole time. But the Bible says that he took Peter... James and John along with him. So you understand that Jesus has dispersed the crowd. That means that Jesus didn't want everybody to be right there with him. Uh, you know, I, I began to wonder to myself, maybe it could be that Jesus knew he needed to get to that miracle or that potential miracle, but he, he knew that there might be somebody else to stop him on the way. So he made everybody disperse. 
He gets Peter, James, and John and heads over with Jairus to that little girl to make sure he gets their brother Claypool when she is needed most. Well, let me tell you, when he gets to that house, he walks inside, he begins to see the tumult, the Bible said. He sees the, pe the people there grieving and weeping and wailing and crying and, and carrying on. Everybody's torn up about that little girl dying. She's laying there dead at this point. And so Jesus makes the decision. He looks round about and tells the people. He says, uh, I don't know why you're making such an ado about this. I don't know what you're making such a big deal. This little girl's not dead as you, you think she is. She's only sleeping. Now, I don't know. I mean, we understand that what death means, and we understand that this was in a time frame that their understanding of death, many times in this time frame, they would declare a person dead by simply putting a candle in front of their face, and if the flame quit flickering, they knew that the life had gone out of that person. So I don't know either way. Maybe the little girl was in a comatose state. I'm not real sure exactly, but Sister Rachel, I know what Jesus said. And the people got, they, they laughed at what he said. They thought he was a madman. They thought he was crazy. They began to mock what he said. In other words, man, you got to be out of your mind. That little girl's dead as dead gets. I want you to walk over there, feel her cold body if you have to. I mean, I'm thinking out loud like what I might have thought of what it might have been like. But Jesus, he let them know that she's not dead. She's only sleeping. Well, that crowd laughed and they laughed and mocked and made fun of Jesus. And you know what Jesus did? Jesus got rid of the doubters and those who did not believe, those who made fun of it. In other words, you don't have no business being in here. We need this room to be full of faith and full of power. So he put all those people out and he took the mama and the daddy by the hand and he walked over to that little girl in the Bible said, Talitha Kumai, that's what Jesus Jesus said, in other words, in interpretation, Jesus looked at the little girl and he said, damsel, I say unto thee, arise. I'm telling you what a thing. I would have loved to have been there that day to watch that dead, cold, still, blue-colored body maybe laying there and her lips maybe already turned blue-gray. There she laid Sister Rachel on that bed, dead as I don't know what. And Jesus said, get up, and that girl got up. I don't know about you, but that will make us have revival. I don't care how dead it is. And I would have loved to have been there to see that moment. But you see, even in the miraculous moment, and as powerful as that is, from the time that that father left the home until that Jesus raised that dead girl up from that bed, we find there are things that we can learn from and live by every single step of the way all the way up to Jairus' house and when the little girl got healed. Honey's ready tonight to dive into some life lessons from a dying daughter tonight. I'm going to start tonight by giving you the very first lesson that the Lord gave me. And this is the very first one. Trouble has no limitations. Trouble has no limitations. What do you mean by that, Brother Myers? Well, I want you to understand tonight, it doesn't matter what position, what your status, what your wealth, what your popularity, what any of that is, but trouble has no limitations. You could be broke. You could be living in a cardboard box underneath a bridge somewhere. You might be living in the woods in a tent, or you might be living in a $2.5 million house amen, down in Islesworth somewhere. A trouble has no limitations. I want you to realize tonight that rich people get cancer just like poor people do. If you go down to the graveyard, you'll find people that have died that were wealthy. You'll find people that were middle class. And you'll find people that were living just above poverty. I want you to realize tonight that trouble has no limitations. And why is that important for us to realize? Because sometimes when you're broke or when you're down or when you're struggling, 
Hallelujah. The devil will get on your shoulder and he'll tell you because you don't got a good education, because you're not smart, or it's because of this or that or the other, and that's why trouble has come to your household. Well, I want you to understand, if you're rich and you got a lot of money, well, you may have more access to insurance or doctors. But outside of that, you must understand that it doesn't matter whether you're rich or you're broke, trouble's going to come. Amen. Rich people break down just like poor people break down. They may have a nicer car. They may not break down as often. But rich people break down and have problems just like poor people. And I want you to know that the most educated people go through times of depression just like people that are broke for go through depression. I was talking with one of my sons the other day. And my son told me, he said, Dad, I'd love to be like another individual that he mentioned. They're going to this great university, got a great education, driving around in a Porsche, probably got lots of friends, and they're probably rich and everything else, just like this young man's family and parents are. Well, I told him, I said, Son, I said, it always looks good on the surface now, don't it? I said, but what I found out the older I've gotten life, I said, it's never enough. I said, the guy who's making $100,000 a year cries all the time because he ain't making 200000 a year. The man that's making 200000 a year, that man's singing the blues because he's not Bill Gates or a billionaire. Him and sitting at the top rubbing elbows with the very elite of society. I want you to know that it's just never enough. And the reality is, uh, how I've said it many times in the past, like my granddaddy told me as a young boy, and man, that man puts his britches on just like you do, son. One leg at a time. He ain't no better than you. And it's important that we realize tonight that trouble has no limitations. Doesn't matter if you're rich. Doesn't matter if you're handsome. Doesn't matter if you're pretty. If you're ugly. You're fat. You're skinny. It don't matter. Trouble has no limitations. Jairus found that out. It didn't matter that he was a ruler of the synagogue. Oh, no. He could have had administrative power, but it still Death came to his house anyway. Somebody say, help us, Lord. The second life lesson that we pick up from this text, it pays to have someone who cares enough to get our problem to Jesus. Did you hear that? I said it pays to have someone who cares enough to get our problem to Jesus. Why is that? Because I don't know about you, but I've had times before that I was so sick that I couldn't pray. There were times I was laying on an operating table and I couldn't pray for me because I was on the operating table. I've stood right along the bedside. I'll never forget many years ago we were attending a, a church. We weren't pa pastoring or doing ministry at the time outside of just a eva little evangelizing. But there was somebody that was a family member to someone in our church and that got into a motorcycle accident. And they were in the hospital in Orlando right over here at Florida South. Me and my wife, we went to the hospital that night. There were cards all over the walls and there were people that that were praying and whatnot. But here laid a person in front of us that had got in a motorcycle accident. They were in a coma and they couldn't pray. I'm glad to know that there are times that it pays to have someone who can get a prayer through, who's someone who can get the trouble or the problem to Jesus when I can't take that problem to Jesus. Someone who cared enough. And I'm glad that little girl had a daddy who would lay it all on the line and make the trip and find out where that water walking, that master, that demon uh, casting out, that, that deaf ear unstopping, that blind eye opener, Jesus. I'm glad that Jairus had enough wherewithal, that he loved his daughter enough, that when she laid dying, that he didn't look at her and say, well, amen, I hope she'll be all right in the morning and go to bed. No, sir. He left and he found where Jesus was. You never discount the people that love you, the ones that are closest to you, because it's good to have some Somebody that can pray with you when you can't pray for yourself. When you're laying there in the bed and your eyes are rolled back in your head and you're unconscious and they've got a, a tube down your throat and you can't talk, you can't hardly even breathe on your own. It pays to have somebody who can call on the only name above all names, the name of Jesus. Somebody who can call the, your name out in prayer and say, Lord, touch my daughter, touch my wife, touch my family in Jesus' name. How many of you? agree with that tonight? 
The third life lesson that we can extract from this story is a delayed miracle is not an incomplete miracle. I said a delayed miracle is not a, an incomplete miracle. Somebody tonight, maybe you're watching, maybe you're listening, maybe you're here, and you say, Pastor, we have been praying for something. We believe God was going to do it. We need God to show up and show out in a big way. But it seems like my answer has been delayed. Have you ever been in a place before that you needed God to do something big, but it seemed like the answer was delayed? I got to talk with a man on the job today who shared his testimony with me and the short version of what he was saying. He was living in Brazil, making a real good pay. He owned his own cabinet business, done custom woodwork and all of that. He said in the corner of his shop, he said every day he'd go there and he'd pray and say, thank you, Lord. I thank you for this business. I thank you for the blessings you've given me. And he would pay respect to the Lord for all God had done. He said one day he knelt down in that corner to pray and the Lord spoke to him and said, I want you to go to Kissimmee, Florida. He said, I opened my eyes and I thought to myself, what is and where is Kissimmee, Florida? He said he got his phone and began to Google trying to find out where Kissimmee was. Him being a man from Brazil speaking Portuguese. He was trying to find a church maybe. He thought maybe that was the connection. So he contacted the only Brazilian church he could find. He said he kept trying to reach out but could never make contact with them for, a, for the longest time. So he went home and he told his wife and family that he felt that God was going to have him sell his entire business, everything that he'd worked years for, to move here not knowing exactly what God's plan was for his life. But in the process of doing all of that, he said that he began to pray earnestly and he said, God, now if you want me to sell this business. This is your business. Everything I got, God, belongs to you. He said, I'm giving it to you and I'm turning this problem over to you. If you want it sold, you will sell it. The very next day, he said he went to work. He was working with another man that came along to help him. While they were working, the man out of nowhere looked at him and said, you know, if you ever thought about selling this business, I believe my son would buy it. He said he, he was kind of taken back and he looked at the man and he said, are you sure? And he said, oh, yeah. So he said, well, how much would you want for your business? He said, I got to ask the Lord. So he said he got to praying and asking the Lord, what would you have me to sell this business for? And he said that the Lord told him a number and amount. He went back and told the amount to that man and his son flew or drove in and paid him the money and he sold the whole entire business. But they still had to come to the United States and they had to settle there and they didn't know anybody. He didn't speak English. He didn't know the language. He was just going by what God told him to do. When he got over here, I said, well, out of everything you've experienced now, because he's doing really well now, I said, what was the hardest thing you went through? And he kind of shook his head. He said, probably the first 15 months. He said, we didn't speak English. My wife didn't speak English. He said, we couldn't communicate with people. I didn't have no job. And he said, for 15 months, he said, we lived off of that money from selling the business. And he said, when the end of that 15 months had come, he said, I'd done give out all the money, paid the money, and I had nothing. I was broke. He said, I thought to myself, God, why am I here? I don't understand. He said, the Lord spoke to him and said now that everything's gone now you know where your priority is and whether you really got your trust in me he said a lady began to pray he said it was around Thanksgiving time he said I got down I began to pray and he said pastor he said it was so discouraging because it was Thanksgiving and he said we had no Thanksgiving dinner we didn't know what we were going to eat we were broke and here's a man that's used to making thousands of dollars a month very well talented and skilled man, very well put together man but doesn't even have the money to eat. His wife took the kids to school and that afternoon 
picked them up and when she picked the kids up the principal of the school came out and handed her a gift card for $100 she brought it home and sold it to her husband and he looked at her and he said what is this she said I don't know but the principal gave it to us he said eyes full of tears he said he looked up and he said thank you God because he said he was trusting in God at this point he said now Thanksgiving's getting real close and he said that another church had reached out and called him on the phone said we just wanted to let you know that every year that our church represents a family and this year you are one of the families that got picked we need you to come pick up the food he said we showed up and he said man everything you could imagine he said it was a beautiful box of all the stuff you need to have Thanksgiving dinner he said within a matter of a few days his wife had been handed personally handed thousands of several hundreds if not a couple thousand dollars in gift cards that just came from nowhere he said oh my lord I couldn't understand it all but God was making a way his kids needed shoes another church that he didn't know apparently contacted him up and said just wanted you to know that our church has got together and they sponsor people for shoes and they picked your family five children that he's got to get brand new shoes we just need to know what size they are I want you to know that right now that man's making a real nice living you know why because for 15 months he spent everything he had and he got all the way down to the end what am I saying to you tonight this is one of my favorite life lessons a delayed miracle is not an incomplete miracle a delayed promise is not an incomplete promise if God tells you I'm going to do something honey you can take it to the bank and cash it because God is true to his word but we've got to be true to trust God to the very end how many of you would agree with me that it's easy to trust God in the good times it's easy to trust God when you got a few thousand still in the bank it's easy to trust God when you've got plenty of tools still to sell you got plenty of things but when you've run out of everything and you've got nothing else you can lean on that's whenever God says alright now we're talking because now you can't lean on your 401k you don't cash that in you can't lean on, on you can't lean on social security because that ain't much to live on anyway now you gotta trust me now you gotta believe in me I want you to know that a, a delayed miracle is not an incomplete miracle in the eyes of God. Boy, I'm telling you, that spoke to me when I read it. And especially when we look at the Word of God, we see that delay means for some people that it's never going to happen. And isn't that a reality the way we are? A delay sometimes feels like it's not going to happen. I mean, put yourself in Jairus' shoes. He's expecting God to show up to an emergency right away. But now he's got a delay. Now he's delayed. I mean, when you have an emergency and something gets in the way, if there was any hope already, it's gone now. That is gone now. There are some of you that may have waited three years. There are some of you that have waited longer than that for other things. What about our children that need to be saved? What about our financial situations? What about things with our health that we have struggled with for so long and we're like, Lord, will I, will I ever get a breakthrough? Will I die like this? Well, I want you to know you'd be a whole lot better off to die believing and trusting and hoping because whenever you do draw your last breath, when you get over on the other side, if you've been faithful to the Lord, you're going to wake up with a glorified body and it ain't going to matter how many oxygen tanks that you were down. It ain't going to matter how much you drug that leg along. It won't matter how much arthritis or gout got in your joints. It won't matter how many headaches you battle with in life. When you get on the other side, you'll be able to shout glory and give God praise because he has brought you through it somebody give the Lord praise tonight especially when you look at Lazarus in the tomb you see that a delayed miracle a delayed miracle is not an incomplete miracle there are specific reasons that I believe that the Lord showed us in the word of God that he waited until after to show us. I can give you an, an example of what I'm talking about. 
A few years ago, this church sunk so down in financial calamity, we didn't know whether we were going to keep the doors open. It hit us one after another after another. I don't have time to go into all of it. But let me tell you one of the things that happened that just blessed my heart. I remember we were in South Carolina. My daughter-in-law, my son, I think it was about the time they were getting married, if I'm not mistaken. And right about that time when all that was going on, everything was falling apart back home. And uh, we had been served papers from something that was before I ever came here to pastor. The property was going up for tax deed auction over just a few hundred dollars, over a million dollars worth of facility was going to go into a tax deed auction for, I, I don't remember what it was, $1,600 or eight to $1,800. And on top of the fact that our insurance was behind, our mortgage payments were behind, electric, everything was behind. And I'm saying, Lord, after all these years of pastoring, is this how I'm going to go out? And I talked Talk to Sister Wilma Miller, who was the insurance agent. She was she's in the Church of God. Her and her husband, Brother Wayman Miller, but she happens to be an insurance agent and who we have used for many years. And I talked to Sister Wilma Miller, and I said, I don't know what we're going to do. She said, Brother Joe, you are in a mess. She said because when that insurance gets canceled, she said, what's going to happen when that insurance cancels? She said it will put you in a higher bracket, and if you can't afford afford the insurance now, it will be twice as much if you go in default because the next provider is going to up it because they know what a risk that it might be. I said, oh God, we can't afford that. How are we ever going to make it? And do you know what happened? I, just like Lazarus and just like Jairus' daughter, I, it got canceled. I said, the insurance got canceled. I called and I talked to Sister Miller and I had tears in my eyes. I was trying to choke it back. I didn't know. I didn't understand it. But while I was on the phone with her talking about it being canceled, she was checking into something and she said, now wait a minute, Brother Joe. Hang on just a minute. I'm looking at something here. I don't understand what's happening or what's going on. She said, but for some reason, she said, they canceled your policy, but it was never put through. And I, and it, right at the time she told me that, somebody else had called and told us that they would make the payment that we needed. And I said, are you sure? She said, yes. I said, well, I can have that payment to you. Somebody in the church was given some and somebody else was given some. And I said, we'll have that payment to you. She said, get it to us as soon as possible before they put it through. We were canceled, but God said it might be a delayed miracle, but it is not an incomplete miracle. And you look around you tonight. We're still here by the grace of God. I said we're still here tonight. The devil didn't want me to be here. Amen. All of hell didn't want us to be here. But by God's grace, we are here tonight because God knew what was ahead and God knew he was going to bring us through it. Lift your hand and give the Lord praise for it. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are you ready for the fourth life lesson tonight? There are times when things get worse before they get better. Now, how does that apply to the story of J. Iris' dying daughter? Very easily, because she was dying. But now he's got word, and the word is, don't bother Jesus anymore. It's too late. She's now dead. I haven't even got him back to the house yet. And it's got worse before it's even got better. I don't know why it works like this. I don't really understand it. It's a miserable feeling. But have I got anybody that can witness with me tonight that can say, you've ever had a time that you were looking around and said, boy, when it rains, it pours. If it ain't one thing, it's another. My boys sometimes will laugh at me because I say that quite a bit. If it ain't one thing, it's another. They laugh at me. I say, well, it's a whole lot better than cussing, ain't it? Come on now. If it ain't one thing, it's another. That's the way a lot of times life feels. But I'm serious when I tell you I've had a few times, man, it was one thing and another thing and another. You look around and the dryer quits working. Well, I don't understand that. And you walk in and open up the refrigerator and all the meat and everything spoiled because it went out last night during the night and you didn't even know it. Or you come home and the whole house is flooded because the hot water heater busts. And then you go, oh, Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. You go out and get in the car and the engine blows up. And you think, Lord, I don't understand. Sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. But here's what I want you to see. 
We don't always realize it, but there's a lot of times the reason it gets worse before it gets better is not about you. Somebody say, it ain't always about me. It's not always about you. Sometimes the reason it gets worse before it gets better is because when Jesus stands in the mouth of the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. It makes that miracle altogether greater because he could have showed up whenever he just needed some NyQuil or a few, amen, a few pills or what have you. But Jesus showed up whenever they said, man, he's by now, he's stinking. The, the body worms are probably in his body. But I'm glad the Lord can step to the mouth of my tomb and say, Joe Mars, come forth. I'm glad God's got the power to raise the dead. And when things get worse before they get better, sometimes it's because whenever we're, when the blood breakthrough comes, God can say, now look at what I've done. It had to be God. If it had only been a couple of weeks, if it had only been a couple of months, I mean the miracle still would be great. But when it goes a year, two years, whenever you got family that are fasting and praying, we fasted and prayed, didn't we? We talked to the Lord, and you were probably just like I was whenever people kept saying, well, you're a great preacher. I know God's got something big for you. Man, I got tired of hearing that. I mean, if you can't be honest on the pulpit, you ain't got no business being in it. I got tired of hearing it. That don't sound spiritual, but I'm being honest. I got tired of hearing it. Why? Because it wasn't happening, and it seemed like it was never going to happen. Well, the Lord's got something great for you, Brother Myers. God's got a big thing for you. And I'm sitting here thinking to myself, how many more years am I going to wait for this? Sometimes you get tired of people asking you, girl, when you going to have some kids? You ever going to have some kids? When you going to have a baby? What's I waiting on? And they don't realize it. You don't want to bust their bubble and come across rude and say we've been trying for the last three years. Would you give me a break? But the thing is, God says to you, listen, I'm going to let it go to one year. I'm going to let it turn into 18 months. I'm going to let it turn into 24 months. I'm going to let it turn into three years. And every time you fasted, you didn't get an immediate response. You didn't get an immediate healing. You didn't get an immediate answer. But in the background God was doing something and God God said when there's three years have passed God said you're going to watch and here you are you look like you swallowed five basketballs why is that that's because amen God knows how to break through even when it looks like he's not going to break through and sometimes you go to the doctor and it's more bad news and it gets worse before it gets better and you come home crying in a mess and you don't want to talk and you and your husband are sitting across the house from each other and you're upset and don't understand and I'm trying to serve God and I'm faithful and I get up there and sing when I don't feel good have asthma attacks and get up and sing when I barely got breath I don't understand I worked all night and got up and went to church Sunday morning we're trying to serve the Lord why is this happening to us Amen. but sometimes when it gets worse before it gets better it ain't about you it's about God getting greater glory I apologize if I'm too wound up tonight I just feel the Holy Ghost in this place Amen. I want you to know that is the fourth one. But I want you to see the reason that sometimes it gets worse before it gets better. Looking at the text was because the news came that that thing that was dying, it's dead. That means that hope that you were holding on to, that it might change. It's like going to the doctor and them saying, oh, I'm sorry to tell you, honey, but People that get this thing like you got, they just don't, hardly ever do they ever get pregnant. And um, it's probably going to cost you about $10,000 in this, this treatment, and we could put you through this. And what insurance do you have as you hold your head down and say, I haven't got none, when the reality is, is all you got Jesus insurance. That's all you got. Well, I can't, I don't know what I'm going to do. I can't take that medicine. And I want you to know something, folks. That, that's the truth and reality of it. How many ready for the number five life lesson from this? Anybody enjoying this? I hope so. Number five life lesson from the text is fear looks forward without hope. I said fear looks forward without hope. When fear sets in, do you know what fear is? I preached this before, and you need to understand this. Maybe make a mental note or write it down. Fear is the unknown. Fear has everything to do with the unknown. What do you fear? What you don't know. 
That's the reason why whenever you go real close to that edge and it's like 200 foot drop down the side, you don't know what it might, what might happen if you get too close and so you get afraid of that. Fear is that when you go into that surgery room and they're about to give you that medicine and tell you to count to 10 backwards, you don't know what's going to happen when you get into the surgery room. I mean, for crying out loud, whenever I had surgery, my, I think it was the first time I ever had surgery, I had my gallbladder removed. It sure wasn't nothing like what she's been through. But I had my gallbladder removed. They told me to count backwards from 10. I don't remember anything but them wheeling me down the hall. And the next thing you know, I woke up in the room. I looked around. I told my wife, I said, something's, something's fishy. She said, what do you mean? I said, because uh, I asked her, I said, are they done? She said, yeah, they already did, and you're back in the room. I said, what? Something don't make no sense. I said, the only thing I remember, I said, it was them wheeling me down the hall. I said, I know what they did. They gave me that verset, that message, that, that medicine that makes you forget. It wipes out your memory. Y'all ever heard of that stuff? That's real. And uh, they, can, they can give you a certain amount. They can wipe out 15 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. Uh, I think it's called verse said or verse said or something like that. And I looked at my wife. I was seriously aggravated. I said, I'm going to talk to the doctor when he gets in here. She said, what about? I said, I, I think they dropped me off the table or something. I said, while they were doing surgery. I said, they had to. I said, why, would they, why were they worried about what I remember? They didn't want me to hear what happened. I was probably screaming or hollering or carrying on or they probably dropped a knife and stuck something in me wrong. I said, they didn't want me to know what happened. That's why they made me lose that memory. But I want you to know when you get back there on that bed, you don't know what's going to happen. And that's why I'm telling you tonight, fear looks forward without hope. But I tell you what faith does. The Word of God proves us that faith looks forward with expectation. But you see, when I look at God's Word, Jesus showed us that truth. When He said, be not afraid, but do what? But only believe because Jesus knew that as he walked along with Jairus, he knew what news that he just got. He knew that it didn't sound promising. He knew that it didn't sound like it was going to work out in his favor. He knew that Jairus was probably imagining the very worst in his mind because fear, when fear looks forward, it looks forward without hope. But when a man's got faith, that faith says it doesn't look like it's going to work out. But I've got faith that somehow faith looks forward with hope. I want you to know you may be going through something right now. Maybe you've got a loved one that it looks like the more you pray, the worse they get. But you've got to be not afraid, but only believe. You've got to have faith that God can work it out. You go to pray and say, God, I don't know what I'm going to do about this house payment. It, it's already two months behind. I don't know what I'm going to do. I might this thing might get repossessed. But you remember this. I'm going to have I'm going to be not afraid and I'm going to believe. And if this house gets repossessed, I'm going to believe God to give me something better. Somebody say praise the Lord. Amen. Number six. How many's ready for number six? We ain't got but seven, so y'all hang on to your britches leg. Amen. Number six. This is the sixth life lesson that God gave me. We must know who should stay. We must know who should stay and what? And who should go? We must know who should stay and who should go. With the Lord's help, I'm going to preach this little thing out here. When Jesus finally gets to the house, and you got these people in there, they don't believe. They're laughing at him. Oh, you're crazy. I mean, come, look at her, man. Her lips are blue. I mean, I'm just imagining what it might have been like. I mean, look at that girl. She's just as dead. She's cold as ice. Look at her. She's dead. You're crazy. Come in here telling everybody that she's not dead. I mean, look at the little girl. But you see, the reality is Jesus realized there are some miracles that for them to happen, for them to transpire, you've got to know who to get rid of and who to keep. You see, in my time of pastoring, if there's any truth that I can, I can attest to, I have watched times that people hold on to and cling to people that bring them down. The potential for them to ever do what God's called them to do will never be realized because they allow the wrong people in their lives. I'm not telling you that we shouldn't be witnesses and lights and we should elevate ourselves above another man. That's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm telling you is that we learn from the Scripture here that you've got to know who's got to stay and who's got to go. How many of you know that there are some people that are poisonous and toxic to your spiritual well-being? There are some people that all they do is gossip all the time, and if you hang out with them all the time, you're going to be drained down like a dead battery that needs to be put on a charger. You're always going to be like, have you ever met anybody that every time they get around you, you're like this? 
they just start talking and your nerves are fried. I mean, I've got a few people like that because every time you get in a room, I just want to shake. I just want to, I don't know, I want to go lay down or something and take a nap because they, they make my nerves frazzled. You know what I'm saying? There are some people that at certain times uh, you've got to know who to let go of and who to keep. And you know what? It's the same way in ministry. I've seen people, they want to build a church and there are people in that church that are infecting that church with a disease called drama. Anybody ever heard of that one? They're infecting the church with a disease called drama. And the church will never go, grow. You know why? Because the Bible said a house divided against itself, will ne- it's not going to stand. And you've got to know who to hold on to and who to let go of. Because sometimes while you're trying to build the kingdom of God, there are some people that are going to hinder the miracle. There's never going to be any talent for Kumai. And daughter, I say unto thee, arise. If we let the wrong people in the house when they don't belong there, you got to get rid of something people amen there's some people you don't need to talk to on the phone there are some people you don't need to sit around the table and communicate with. There are some people you don't need to hang out with. There are some people that whenever you are in a place of your life, you need a breakthrough. You don't need them in your ear. You, you really, really need to take seriously what I'm telling you. And it's not just people in the form of a person physically standing in front of you. Sometimes it can be as much as the things through people that entertain you on your cellular phone or on your television or anything else because there are certain people you've got to know who to let go of and who to hold on to. You say, I don't know why I'm always so spiritually drained. There are some people that they turn off the garbage they watch all the time and they listen to, they wouldn't be drained. But if you feed the flesh all the time with garbage, the flesh man is going to be stronger than the spirit man. If you spend as much time delving into the spiritual things of God as you do the worldly things and the garbage, your spirit man would be strong enough to tell your flesh man, no. No, you can't have that. No, you're not going there. No, you're not going to say that. But when you feed the flesh man all the time, the flesh is stronger than the spirit. And that's the reason the spirit man, should I say, and that's the reason why. That's why the Bible said, if a man walks in the spirit, he will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'm telling you, you've got to know who to let go of and who to keep. I've seen young people. He's tall, dark, and handsome, and he smells like Perry Ellis. Her hair... I started to be like Solomon. Her teeth are like flocks of goats. I don't know. They might have thought that was poetry back in the day, but it sure ain't. If I told my wife that her teeth looked like a flock of goats, I'd probably get slapped. Huh? I wouldn't blame her. But the reality is, when we look at God's Word, you've got to know who to hold on to and who to let go of. Who is in your inner circle tonight? Who are the people that you communicate with? Who is the source of your negativity? Do you realize tonight that there are some people that bring such negativity into your life that it keeps you miserable all the time? I've met people in the church before. They had partner up with somebody else in the church. They typically would just mind their business, you know. They don't ever, they don't have a problem. Then they start talking to some person in the church, and the next thing you know, they come to church a puffed out with their lips stuck out. I have no idea why they're upset, and then later I find out it was because sister what's-her-name or brother so-and-so or whoever it was filled their head full of a bunch of stuff and caused them to think something that you got to know who to hold on to and who to let go of. Amen. We're going to move on to the last one. Somebody say, give it to us tonight. Number seven, Jesus sees beyond what's dead or dying. Jesus sees beyond the thing that's dead or dying. Unfortunately, even when I try, sometimes all I can see is what is in front of me. Through my natural flesh, I try to to get a hold of God and in the Spirit, Sometimes I do okay, and then other times I'm just being transparent with you. It's all I can do to see beyond what's right in front of me. That bill that's got to be paid or that problem that's in front of me, I don't know what I'm going to do. But the good news is is that if, I, I'll give you like this. I had a preacher friend of mine many years ago. He shared this with me, and it stuck with me. 
his transmission went out on his car, an old station wagon car. And he said, uh, Brother Joe, he said, I've never worked on a transmission in all my life. I didn't know where he was going with the story. And I said, is that right? He said, yeah. He said, but you see that station wagon sitting there? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, we were broke. I didn't have any money. I couldn't take it to a transmission repair shop. They would have cost, it cost me a couple thousand dollars. He said, transmission just completely went out. He said, I got down on my knees and I said, Lord, I don't have the answer to this problem. He said, but you do. And I'm coming to you, and I need you to give me the answer. You know why? Because God sees beyond the dead and the dying. He sees beyond what's going on. He said, I, I took that transmission out of the car, never took one out, never worked on one. He said, I took it apart. He said, I had pieces laying everywhere. He said, all, every time I take a piece out, he said, I'm just praising the Lord, asking God to help me. Before it was all over with, he said, he fixed the transmission, put it all back together, put it back in, and it ran and never gave him another problem the whole time he owned it. You know why? Because the Lord sees beyond the problem that you see. When you look, you see this issue. That's what you see. Sister Miranda, what was that disease they say that you have? PCOS, I'm not going to try to pronounce it, but PCOS, yeah, the Lord is able to see beyond that. If, if the doctor says stage four cancer, you, you, may as, you may just as well end up passing and going on to be with Jesus. But either way, I know that the Lord sees beyond that problem and that situation. He knows what the other side looks like. If Sister Benefield could be here tonight and, and testify to you that are here, I remember back whenever uh, we had an associate pastor, associate pastor's wife at the time, Sister Benefield went in for a procedure. And while they were in there doing this procedure, they found out she had cancer in her colon, on her colon. They had to remove, if I'm not mistaken, several feet of her colon while they were in there. And, and when she first found out, the prognosis didn't sound very good. And Sister Benefield is getting up in her age, and on top of that, she's had cancer before. So this didn't sound good at all. They're saying, well, it probably could have got into your lymph nodes, and those of you that have ever heard or dealt with cancer, you know when they start talking about it getting in other parts of your body, that's when they start getting concerned. But as Sister Benefield laid there on that table, I remember her. This is what she told me. She was crying on the phone. She said, Brother Myers, I just don't understand. And this was in her mind, simple as it is. She said, I read my Bible. She said, I pay my tithes, and I go to church, and I love the Lord. I don't understand. And I said, Sister Benefield, I said, there are things in this life we don't understand. I said, but the good news is, I said, God knows how to bring you through this. You know why? He sees beyond what's dead and what's dying. That's good news for somebody, maybe somebody here, maybe somebody listening or watching online tonight. It's good news to know that he sees beyond whatever problem you're having right now. And you're saying, I don't know what to do about this situation. He knows exactly what you need to do. They said, do I sell this house, Lord? He knows exactly what to do. Let me give you a little piece of a testimony, and then I'm going to close this service out. Hopefully this has been a blessing to you. The gentleman that testified to me today that lived in Brazil and moved over here, I asked him, I said, so, so the contractor that I'm working for right now, I said, so how did you get to work in for this contractor? And he started explaining to me that he did a bunch of custom work on his really, really nice house and uh, that the contractor liked his work so much he wanted him to be a superintendent, work for him. And he said he looked at the guy's name's Ray, and he said, uh, well, I'll pray about it, and if the Lord wants me to work for you, then I will. And uh, Ray looked at him, and if I understood what he was saying correctly, he, he was kind of joking with him. He said, well, I think that the Lord wants you to work for me. But he said he went to praying about it. He said, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? Should I work for this man? Because he had already started up his own business, and he was getting it going. It was going good. And he went to an appointment that he was supposed to meet somebody, and the guy ended up, he was going to be an hour late. So he said he needed a haircut. And he said he looked across the street and saw a barber shop there. 
And so he went in the barber shop to get his hair cut. And when he sat down in the chair, the guy started cutting his hair, and they made small talk like they normally do in barber shops. And he asked him, you know, where he worked. And he told him, he said, well, I work for this guy. And told him the guy's name. He goes, oh, I think I've heard of him and such as that. And he said, all of a sudden, the guy was cutting his hair, and he just stopped. And he took a step back, and he looked at him. And while he was telling this story, you could see the tears in his eyes telling, recapping this story. He took a step back and looked at him, and he said, you need to go to work for that man. And he looked at him, and he said, I am working for him. He said, no, 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 no. I mean, you need to go to work for him. And he said, all of a sudden, it was just like he had just got through praying a few minutes before that, Lord, I need you to tell me if this is what I need to do. He went home, and uh, the rest is history. He's been working for him for a long time now. God is able to speak to you, and he's able to give you the answer that you need. You know why? Because he sees beyond what you're going through. He sees beyond the sickness, beyond the, the financial struggle, beyond the, the unsaved loved ones. He knows what's on the other side. And so we need to have faith and belief for that. We just stand all across the house as we get ready and close. We're going to close in prayer. I'd like for you to pray tonight that everything that we've talked about, everything that's been preached or, or taught, uh, that it will find good ground. How many of you remember the parable in the Bible about the different types of ground? Good ground. And uh, I want this message, whether it's through the Internet or here tonight, I want it to find good ground and I want it to uh, speak to somebody. Before we get to prayer tonight, is there anybody tonight you feel like maybe something that was said, maybe it's ministered to you at all, maybe God spoke to you in some way, maybe it helped you? hope so. We're going to have a word of prayer, and we're going to trust that the Lord will speak to you. If you would like to get the, uh, the seven life lessons from me tonight, I have them up here. If you'd like to take them home with you in case you missed anything, 